Welcome to the Green Drinks Replay from our April 2022 edition on Mass Timber. We welcome Tim Bueller from the Canadian Wood Council, Mark Gaglioni from Ellis Dawn, and Patrick Crabbe from Bird Construction. Enjoy this replay. All right, welcome everybody to Green Drinks April. And for the, those of you who don't know me, I am Nick Hebb with SmartNet Alliance. And the Alliance is a group of businesses and organizations who collaborate on projects and initiatives to accelerate Canada's transition to a sustainable economy. For more information on SNA, consult our website. And I'll share that into chat shortly as well. Be sure to check out our membership page, all our amazing members doing great things. Um, and I'll put a link into the chat box as well. So it's just about two years since we first featured Mass Timber right here on our virtual green drinks. And since then, the industry has been on fire. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, every week brings new announcements about projects throughout Canada that will reach new heights building with wood. Our three speakers tonight are at the forefront of that change. We are delighted to welcome back Tim Bueller from the Canadian Wood Council. Mark Gaglion from LS Dawn, and joining them we have Patrick Crabbe from who is the director of Mass Timber over at Bird Construction. Tim will give us a, uh, a quick overview of Mass Timber and catch us up on all the changes since his last presentation. Mark will uh, give us the goings on at LS Dawn and show us some of the latest projects that are pushing the limits in the Toronto area. And lastly, Patrick's going to speak about embodied carbon element and give us a glimpse of everything going on over at Bird Construction. So we've got a great event ahead, uh, some great presentations. Remember, you can add your, um, your questions into chat and I'll get those over to the speakers after each presentation. So first up, we've got Timothy Bueller and he's a senior manager in marketing development operations over at Woodworks at the Canadian Wood Council. In the past 15 years, he has helped to build a network of wood champions and experts throughout North America to promote the use of timber in the built environment. Tim's extensive knowledge in the industry comes from dozens of technical conferences, tours, meetings, and workshops across North America and Europe. As the senior manager for market development operations, he works closely with the wood industry with multiple levels of government associations, chairing technical committees and leading working groups to address wood construction roadblocks. He's been involved in over 200 timber projects. So welcome in Tim, you can share your screen, get unmuted and excited to uh, catch up and, and hear what you've been up to and, and give us an overview on mass timber. Awesome, thank you, uh, Nick. Uh, I gotta say, did you have a career in DJing or radio at some point because you got the voice for it man absolutely thanks so uh, much yeah yeah try to uh try to make it smooth there for you but uh yeah no you're gonna enjoy this presentation so over to you Tim and uh thanks again for joining us it was great to have you a couple of years ago and uh I was excited when you said you could come back and uh, give us an update on everything going on yeah absolutely and and thanks for the invite and it's excellent to be here I see a few uh familiar names on the attendee list as well. So that's great to see. And, you know, a uh, great setup. It uh, looks like we have a pretty knowledgeable crowd, which is great because I'm not getting into the basics too much as, as uh, a lot of has changed since um, 2020 in the mass timber world. Um, so, you know, thanks for that introduction. Um, the picture here that you see is I'm standing in front of a tower called Ho Ho in Austria. And that is another one of the uh, uh, taller mass timber buildings in the world. So when we talk about mass timber, you know, Nick alluded to a few and, and uh, sorry, just to update your quiz for next time, Ascent did just top out in, uh, in Milwaukee. So it's slightly, slightly higher by, by a few meters. Um, but this building pictured here is 24 stories. Um, it's a mixed use building that's hotels, apartments um, and some other, uh, other amenities. So we're not talking about um, timber products replacing what we're used to seeing in wood. This is a completely different type of product that is a viable uh, alternative to concrete and steel and, and you know, in many cases, a, uh, a comparable or even superior product. So I work for a company called Canadian Wood Council. Uh, we've been around since 1959 and our uh, mission is to represent the Canadian wood products industry through a national federation of associations. So we become Canada's voice for the wood products industries. Lots of associations uh, exist out there. So we're the unified voice. Um, so we, you know, help uh, with different levels of government, 
uh, and so on. And we want to expand market access and increase demand for Canadian wood products uh, through excellence in code standards, regulations, and education. But one of our programs um, is called Woodworks, and it's a coast-to-coast -coast program. Our head office in Ottawa focuses on codes and engineering. So when you see uh, changes in the building code um, or uh, handy tools like the wood design manual, uh, our engineers in the Ottawa office were, were behind a lot of that, and they do an excellent job. But uh, in the early uh, 2000s, late 90s, there was kind of a address, addressing a need of the fact that there wasn't much of a, a marketing department uh, for wood construction. So the Woodworks program is formed in British Columbia, which is a pretty obvious place for a wood promotion program to be formed in our country. Uh, it's a huge industry on the West Coast and slowly evolved throughout the years to have offices in uh, Alberta, Ontario, uh, Quebec, Bois, and, and the um, Atlantic provinces as well. So our goal is to promote wood construction uh, to designers, to communities, and to uh, communicate all the excellent resources that our engineers produce. We do that through offering project uh, support through one-on-one -on -one meetings, technical inquiries. We uh, serve as a help desk through our Ottawa office. Um, kind of like to consider ourselves the uh, search engine of the wood products industry. If we can't get the answer right away, we can certainly refer you to somebody uh, who has. And we do different presentations like this one in, uh, to educate, inspire, and offer customized talks for clients who are looking to learn more about specific um, areas of timber construction. Our woodworks uh, groups, along with our Ottawa office, produce a number of technical resources. Again, I mentioned the wood design manual. We do uh, building specific case studies. Um, as most of you probably know, regional and national building codes can be quite cumbersome. So we produce references to the wood specific parts of the code and different guides to uh, specific building typologies that can commonly built, uh, be built out of uh, light wood frame or mass timber products. Uh, so, you know, we do, we do this because the resource is, it's a local resource. I mean, I'm in North Bay, Ontario, as many of you who have driven north of Toronto, once you kind of get past the Barrie area, there's a lot of trees and then once you get beyond North Bay, there's a lot of, a lot of trees, uh, as is much of our country covered in, um, you know, excellent forest resources that are managed to the highest standards in the world. So when we talk about uh, sustainable harvesting, we're certainly leading the world uh, in that regard. So we're not looking at anything like deforestation. That's a common misconception that you know if we build all of our structures out of, out of timber that we're going to run out of trees at some point certainly not the case in fact uh, little known fact is that most countries that increase sawmill production actually increase forest coverage because of the rigorous standards associated with uh, sustainable forcing also supports over 155,000 uh, jobs this is an Ontario specific uh, statistics so i mean throughout the country you know we're, we're a very large industry um but i mean we're here to talk about uh mass timber and it's an important subject uh that more and more people are getting interested in uh and it's you know really gaining a lot of popularity for a number of different reasons timber construction uh standard is uh, lightwood frame now this is a great way to build these products are readily available, relatively inexpensive, um, easy to work with. You know, a skilled carpenter can uh, assemble a building with you know little more than uh, nails and the appropriate lumber and hammer. If if you want to look at uh, historical methods, they haven't really changed much except for the efficiencies of power tools and um, prefabrication. But the limitations in uh, regular timber construction in terms of spans and strengths, uh, you know, you can only really build up to certain sizes and certain heights. But we've uh, addressed some of those with what we've called structural composite lumber or heavy timber, which is kind of the precursor to the terminology that we uh, have now adopted as mass timber. But 
up until you know 25 to 30 years ago, these types of products were really only used in uh, as a supplement to the traditional framing methods that that we were familiar with. But in Europe, um, they started working with these mass timber products a little bit earlier than we were. And when we get into mass timber construction, it's essentially a game changer in what we can we can do with uh, with wood construction. These are not, you know, two by four through two by twelve by any means. We're talking about massive panel products that are, you know, uh, four, six, eight meters wide, up to 30, 40 meters long in some situations. Um, they can be used in columns and beams. And the beauty of, about these is they're factory finished, uh, which takes care of a lot of the uh, potential moisture issues that you see with wood construction. Uh, On-site issues are, um, you know, all but eliminated. The, crews that are required to assemble these are extremely small. Um, Nick mentioned the Brock Commons building in Vancouver, the student residence, 18 story building uh, was assembled by a crew of nine, including the crane operator in about nine and a half weeks, the timber structure. And it allows us to have larger spans, si uh, increased size of, of members and increased strength. We've got no need to cure or reshore. So the assembly, as was mentioned earlier, is extremely fast, um, which means you can occupy your building faster. You have to insure it for less time. You have fewer workers on site. Um, you're disrupting the neighborhood for less time. The noise level is minuscule in comparison to uh, what it takes to put up steel and concrete buildings. So the advantages are, are um, just numerous. And in addition to uh, the family of products that you see here and see on, on the left, uh, it allows for a free form of architecture that we don't really see in, in other building products. You can really do anything with glue lamb that you can uh, imagine in terms of curvature, in terms of uh, spans. It's pound for pound, you know, as strong um, as steel. And depending on, I won't get into the products too much, but you know, speak to your timber supplier when you're looking at these types of projects. And depending on what you're trying to accomplish, there's, there's an efficient mass timber product out there that can be used for your floor or your wall, elevator shafts, uh, roof structures. If you wanna use post and beam construction, it's all there in terms of mass timber. And there's efficient ways to do it if you want to expose all of it, if you want to encapsulate some of it. Uh, I know my, my colleagues who uh, have a lot of experience actually building these buildings can really assist with those types of questions on what product do I need to use? When do I need to use it? How does it work? Uh, which is you know, such an excellent uh, advantage in this type of um, industry is that the manufacturers and, and builders get involved an early uh, stage in the design and construction of these buildings. So maybe you have a little bit of upfront design time added on, but it all, you know, just wins in the end when it comes to actually building the building speed is, is crazy. So as I mentioned, you know, um, in light wood frame, we have our limitations. You can go up to about six stories. Um, you know, quite safely, and that's what's allowed in, in the building codes at this time. But in order to increase the height and the span, you have to get into that post and beam or uh, kind of balloon mass timber framing that you see here. So it's important to mention when you look at these framing uh, systems that they're, you know, especially the mass timber options are kind of unique to the wood construction. You know, you're not looking at, um, if you have something designed in concrete, you can't necessarily replace it with mass timber, just swap out the concrete with mass timber. That's not really how it works. Um, it's a different type of building. Don't kind of ask yourself, well, how do I make this building out of wood? You start with a timber building from the beginning uh, and have that mindset and then you, you know, can see what the possibilities are with timber construction, which um, you know, it, it'll probably surprise you what you what you can achieve. I mean, all all sorts of 
uh, buildings from factories to warehouses to skyscrapers to academic buildings, uh, metropolitan stations can all be built out of fantastic mass timber projects and many examples exist in Toronto, Ottawa, all throughout uh, Canada of these buildings in action. Um, and you can't, you know, take away from the design impact. One of the advantages of my position over the years that I've had, uh, you know, the, the luck to travel to so many different building sites and uh, this one in particular um, in, uh, in BC, I mean, you, you're hard pressed to bring anyone through these, you know, beautiful post and beam structures without many of the tour members, you know, uh, heading up and essentially giving the column a hug or, you know, you can't take your eyes off, off the ceiling and, you know, do yourself a favor and pay attention when you walk into um, steel and concrete towers or, or other building typologies um, in timber and, and, and other building materials and see, see where your eyes are drawn, you know, like I, I'd be hard pressed to see somebody staring at a typical uh, drop ceiling in a, in a steel or, or concrete building. I mean, there's just not much that catches your eye with these beautiful exposed timber ceilings. Give us so many advantages, you know, in addition to the structure being the finish um, and the efficiency, we have uh, what we now refer to as biophilia, which is the uh, condition that, you know, human beings feel more comfortable when they're surrounded by natural elements, so things like green roofs or uh, green walls. Um, exposed timber is one of the uh, major elements in terms of biophilia, so this leads to all kinds of human advantages. I mean, how many of you uh, who worked in offices for the past uh, or previous parts of their career over the past two years, you know, working from home when you can see your backyard or step outside versus being stuck in an in a office with the buzzing neon lights. I mean, I think we all feel a little bit better than we did uh, two and a half years ago on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, I think it's been evident, you know, that we've all been allowed back in our offices for many months, depending on where you live. And a lot of us are either fighting to continue to work from home or at least have a hybrid version of their former job. So we want to be around natural elements where we feel comfortable. It's uh, no way to live in, in the world to spend so much of your time just cooped up indoors. Um, so finally, I just want to kind of wrap up what I'm talking about as an intro is that, um, you know, the building code can, can be your friend or your, or your enemy if you're working with timber construction. Um, it is allowed in all different types of buildings. Um, and if it isn't allowed in sizes or specifications that I'm gonna quickly run through, we have um, what's called an alternative solution or equivalency process where you can uh, prove to the building department that you're working with that not only is this product uh, performing the same way as a steel or concrete, but it's, it's obviously safe and, and sound as a building material. So, you know, in different uh, group A divisions, these are things like restaurants, arenas, anywhere where people gather, you can build relatively large buildings um, in one to two stories, uh, as sprinklered or not sprinklered, but, you know, it kind of caps out there. So multi-story uh, things like schools and whatnot, libraries are not really um, possible fully out of wood unless you go into that alternative solution process. So that's something that we work on in the Canadian Wood Council is to expand building codes and allow for ease of uh, getting these types of buildings through building apartments um, because you know they're fully as safe as other building materials. Um, in addition to that, you know, uh, Group C and D, which are Group C is residential uh, or things like hotels, uh, you can go up to six stories with, you know, relatively decent building sizes, um, as well as Group D, which would be our offices uh, and commercial type structures, um, up to six stories as well. And in addition to that, you know, the one of the most beautiful uses of timber is in a in a in a roof structure and. Uh, for up to two-story buildings, if it's sprinkled throughout, uh, you can almost always put a, a timber roof on there. Um, so if you're if you're constrained a little bit by the building code, don't forget about uh, looking into the potential of a roof structure. And 
This is actually uh, Algonquin College. Um, so if you're in the Ottawa area and you want to check out that library, uh, it certainly is worth a look. But on that note, you know, the National Building Code of Canada recently came through within the past few weeks. And now we're looking at uh, mass timber up to 12 stories uh, with certain amounts of encapsulation and encapsulation in that um, Group C and Group D occupancy, which is absolutely fantastic for the industry. Um, there's talk of, of expanding that code into the A occupancies and, and even looking into performance-based codes, which would just allow you to prove that you're meeting the requirements of the code regardless of the material. So, you know, as Nick mentioned, we've come a long way in, in the last two years, and even still our friends in the US allow for up to uh, 18 stories in mass timber. So hopefully not too far behind that because they used the uh, Brock Commons student residence that was mentioned earlier as the, the case study for um, uh, one of the case studies for allowing those code changes. We, ha we have this material available to us, readily available to us. More and more uh, suppliers are coming up in the Canadian market or getting interested in the Canadian market, which is absolutely fantastic. So that's helping with uh, delays in supply chain. It's helping make products more competitive. Um, you know, it's, it's just a great time to be in our industry. We're seeing potential for some of the largest buildings in the world in our marketplace, which uh, really puts us on the map as a leader in sustainability, among other things. So, you know, I, I love being a part of this. It's fantastic to work like uh, work with people like Patrick and with Mark um, and see what what they can come up with in terms of innovative projects and and uh, fantastic use of this material. Uh, the more you get familiar with it, the more creative you can you can get. And uh, we have a great network. I'll just throw my contact info up here of experienced architects, engineers, uh, code consultants that can help make your kind of mass timber dreams a reality, so to speak. Um, and I'm excited to see what, uh, what Pat and, and Mark have in terms of project examples that they've worked on to show you all because um, I think you'll be surprised what we can do with wood construction, uh, even compared to two years ago. It'd be great to see where we are, you know, five years from now. But I thank you for the time. Happy to answer any questions if we do have a couple, couple minutes and uh, hear from my colleagues as well. Great. Fabulous presentation, Tim. Thanks so much for uh, setting the plate there and kind of going through some of the different innovation. I know I've got a question or two myself, but I want to go through some of the um, the audience questions there. I know we had a, a couple answers from some of the speakers, which has been great, but I kind of want to get your take on some of these. Edward's just wondering, how does wood compare with concrete fire safety wise? That's something we always talk about when uh, we talk to timber and those big buildings. Talk to us about the fire safety a little bit there. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, um, we are aware as an industry of the potential vulnerability in lightweight frame construction. That's why when, you know, you look around your house, that drywall uh, isn't just there for being a pain in the butt to patch when you miss the, the hammer on, on the nail. It's a fire resistive element as well as things like insulation, et cetera. So we know that lightweight frame requires fire resistive elements to meet the uh, specifications of the building code. But what's fantastic when you get into um, products like mass timber is that it has a different property in terms of fire safety. So um, think of a campfire. If you put a giant log down, you'd be hard pressed to get that thing to ignite no matter what you do with your lighter or match. And mass timber being uh, so gigantic, it doesn't actually ignite in the same way as, as smaller wood products would. It slowly chars and it chars at a very predictable rate, um, regardless of the species used for the most part. Um, at about, uh, I think it's about 0.65 millimeters per minute. So the fire resistive nature of mass timber and that predictable char rate allows uh, engineers et cetera, to the design what's called a sacrificial layer. So your beam and your column is actually larger than it needs to be to hold up structure, so to speak. So you protect the wood on the inside so that the building um, will stay standing 
within that uh, allotted amount of time to meet building code requirements so that people can um, escape the building uh, and the building will you know, resist that fire for whatever amount of time it needs. So it certainly isn't um, anything that's as vulnerable to fire as small wood pieces are. So it can certainly meet all the requirements of building code. So Tim, uh, just to jump in here is, For sure. this is a 105 year old wooden church in New Brunswick that burnt recently. And when it happened, everyone sent me the, uh, the link to the CBC article, like Patrick, this is an issue. And I'm like, no, this is an opportunity. Look at what's yeah. left. You know, you have just like the massive wood elements that, that you know, are, are left behind. Just, uh, you know, thought I would show kind of a realistic uh, example of exactly what Tim was talking about. Was that a melted piece of steel hanging over the side there? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that, that's like, I, I mean, you hate to, hate to see a fire like that, but I wow. love to show people that example of the melted steel hanging on top of the vulnerable piece of wood. Yeah, no, no, that's incredible. I think, uh, you know, all of us going out to the cottage camping and can understand, hey, you know, you can't just put a big piece of wood and get it rolling, right? You need those smaller pieces. And we've all been there trying to get that fire going, I think. Um, so a couple other questions here. Paul's wondering, uh, do tall mass timber buildings have to have concrete cores for shear? Um, so per build, well, they don't have to. The uh, the tallest one in the world right now, or, sorry, not ascent, but the one in Norway that you mentioned, does in fact have a timber core made out of CLT. They don't have to. I'm, I'm going to let Mark and and Pat jump in here, but they don't have to. Oftentimes, it's the best solution. I don't want to you know say that that it can always work with a with a wood core, but Oftentimes, uh, it, it's the best use of material to sometimes supplement with a concrete core. But Mark, you uh, you jump in here. Yeah, I mean, you got it, Tim. Like, yeah, you don't have to do it. You can go you can go full timber, you know, pretty easily up to six. You know, it's all of these things generally boil down to cost conversations with our clients and uh, and also approval conversations with our authorities. And you know, they like you need to be able to get out of the building in a non-combustible material, uh, you know, in certain provinces. And uh, you also need a pretty strong lateral system as the building gets taller. And so that's why a lot of projects opt for concrete cores because it's an acceptable solution to the authorities already. It's non-combustible and it's a really efficient and stiff lateral system. As you get taller and taller, uh, you know, we've done a lot of assessments on uh, concrete versus precast versus timber cores and the forces are not linear as your building gets bigger and bigger and so as you gr building grows it actually becomes quite a bit more expensive to deviate from concrete which is why you've kind of seen the first swath of buildings go with concrete cores and um, you know there are a bunch of lower ones dabbling in lateral systems that are not cast in place including you know, we're doing an eight story and a six story right now without concrete cores, which I'll show you in a second here. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, and very, very, oh, I'll, ahead, uh, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll say too that, uh, you know, when you do have like concrete masonry for like a five or six story building, and ultimately what you want to do is erect the combustible por or sorry, the non-combustible portions as quickly as possible before the mass timber comes in. And you have to be able to support those for wind loads. So that can also be, you know, challenges for having dissimilar materials in your project if you're not doing a, you know, concrete core, concrete stairwell. Interesting. No, uh, great to uh, great to see that perspective. Um, uh, Justin was wondering about the shrinkage factor. I know we had a little bit of discussion in chat there, but Tim, did you want to talk a little bit about, he says, so renewables aside, what about the shrinkage factor in uh, building with wood? Yeah, so I mean, it's not as big as a concern um, with mass timber elements, for sure. It certainly uh, comes into play when you get into five, especially five and six story um, light wood frame. I think, uh, you know, sometimes you're looking at about, what, about half, 
half an inch per story of potential shrinkage. So um, when you get into five and six stories, even four stories, there's a lot of systems out there. Um, it's called like a, like a tie rod system. So it essentially expands and contracts with the building to keep uh, everything where it should be, I guess is kind of the, the best way to, to uh, sum it up. But, you know, shrinkage is, it is a factor with timber construction, but it's a known factor. So you get experienced design people in place and they'll be able to address everything uh, when it comes to, to shrinkage and the acceptable kind of moisture content for wood is, uh, you know, that's again a known factor that that is uh, relatively easy to control uh, if, if you've got the proper um, precautions in place. And again, less of a less of an issue with with mass timber. Um, these products, you know, are, are factory controlled and factory sealed, so they don't really um, have to deal with the same same issues. And then when you get into some really interesting products like mass plywood panels or uh, uh, larger LVLs, etc., because it's such small pieces of wood that are compressed together, it's really not an issue. Oh, great! Uh, something to think about, and, and nice to know that those designers are sort of working with that as well. So. So that's great. Uh, I had one other, a couple others. Gutem's wondering, is there any third party studies that compare the mass timber versus ICF construction from the carbon footprint perspective and thermal mass perspective? Not sure if you know any of the top of your head or you want to share some on chat later. Not off the top of my head. I'll take a, I'll take a look as we uh, go through the, uh, I know I've got a couple of life cycle assessment kind of studies that I, that I might be able to throw in the chat, but uh, nothing that comes, comes to mind. Okay, yeah, we'll let you uh, we'll let you circle back on that with Gutem. Michael's wondering how does forest management deal with growing increase in wildfires, insects, and other issues in addition to forest harvesting? Are there risks associated to harvesting when other parts of the country's forests are recovering from these issues? Good question, Michael. That's a great question, man. I, I, I wish I had some members of the Forest Industries Association with me today, but uh, I think. You know, a, a sustainable forest forestry is often um, these are a lot of smart people that that make this happen the way it's supposed to happen. And selective harvesting, as it's known, is actually designed to replicate nature. So replicate things like wildfires and insect damage. Um, obviously, you know, we're kind of in an unprecedented world in terms of climate change. Um, I'm not a forester. I can't. Uh, I can't speak to this with with confidence. But I'm I'm under uh, the impression that these types of things are definitely fact factored in. But uh, you know, I I would defer that um, just because I don't want to misspeak per se. Yeah, I'm sure, uh, Patrick. Maybe I, wants to jump yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I just uh, returned from the annual uh, Canadian Woodlands Conference, which talked about things like this and. In every province, they do very intensive understanding of maturity of certain stands and, I guess, economic viability versus risk to carbon release. So if they are sick, uh, based on, you know, insects coming in and, and what that would do, or if they are risk to fire. So it's very complicated to assess on, like, a global answer, but... Um, engage your uh, regional and, and provincial natural resource groups and ask that question because I was blown away at the level of research that they've done to help, you know, understand the carbon picture of harvesting in certain parts of the province of Nova Scotia versus leaving them alone based on that question itself. So great question. Yeah, I'm just yeah, throwing absolutely. a couple of, uh, sorry, Nick, I'm just throwing a couple of uh, of good resources in the in the chat as well for some forestry associations and 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 others as well. Absolutely, no. Thanks so much, Tim. Uh, you've been a wealth of knowledge. I've got a couple other questions about the building code stuff, but maybe we'll sort of save that to the end if you can stick around, um, and we can do a bit of a panel on that. Uh, but yeah, want well, thank you so much for for bringing us up to speed, and uh, yeah, hopefully you can stick around and we can get a few more questions in uh, after the other two presentations. My pleasure.
All right. So next up, we have Mark Gaglioni, and he's the director of construction sciences over at Ellis Dawn. And congratulations on your promotion there, Mark. I saw that on LinkedIn a little while ago, so that's great. Nice to see you moving up the ladder, so to speak. Um, so yeah. he's initially initially trained as an engineer. Uh, Mark spent the early part of his career in private real estate development. Now with Ellis Dawn, he's in construction science division where he's focused on accelerating the adoption of emerging construction technologies and has played, played a central role in the proliferation of mass timber. So he's a great uh, guy to get on and uh, give us uh, an update on what's going on. So thanks again for joining us, Mark. Great, thanks, thanks so much. And uh, good to see some familiar faces around the room. Um, so it's been a couple of years since I was here last and a, a few things have changed. I just wanted to start by introducing myself again. Um, you know, I mentioned I'm part of the construction sciences team at Elliston, uh, IPA drinker. I'm not sure what everyone's drinking currently, but uh, actually tonight's currently drinking a cider. So I had to throw that in. Um, but I work in this group called construction sciences. You know, most people know Elliston as like a big contractor uh, around Canada. We do a lot of buildings, a lot of infrastructure, uh, transit systems, things like that, and which is true. What a lot of people don't know is that Elliston also has like a bunch of teams that support the core operation of construction. And so construction sciences is one of those teams, uh, which I'm the director of. And we have, um, you know, upwards of 45, 50 engineers in the team that just do all kinds of crazy R&D uh, and engineering work to help support this giant company. And so my team, you know, we're the R&D engine of the company. So we do whatever we can to keep Elston on like the cutting edge of all material specialties. So we've got concrete experts and glass and glazing experts. And I'm uh, lucky enough to have been handed the timber file uh, about four or five years ago and have been working um, on that um, trying to understand it since. So that's a, a bit about Elliston. That's all the propaganda there'll be in the uh, slide deck here. I wanted to kind of pick up, you know, pick up from where Tim was talking about on some of the jobs that are, you know, this is kind of the, the domain that Mass Timber has had over the years. And this is, you know, Mass Timber is not something new to Elliston or the industry in general. These are just a few of the jobs around the country. You know, there's art galleries in Toronto, uh, fancy pool roofs in BC, um, aquatic centers out in Newfoundland, kind of coast to coast. We've been doing a lot of this stuff. And the thing you'll notice that's the same about them all is that, you know, they're all just like boutique structures, right? This is not the core base building. These are like the fancy atrium. They're really like the showpiece of these jobs. And uh, up until the building code changes that Tim mentioned, um, that are starting to happen and have been happening since about 2015. This is what Timber is all about. This is like as far as a lot of people um, in North America went with Timber. So, you know, that was Ellis Don's involvement in it. You know, also, you know, we want, I want to talk about like where it's going from here and what we're working on these days. And so, you know, we built a passive community center at BC. We built a um, fancy uh, pavilion in Dubai for the Canadian Expo. These all happened in the last couple of years. Again, all, same domain though. These are just like the fancy boutique structures. Uh, Timber is very good at it. It's been living in that world for decades. So where is Timber going from here? The, the response from all those building code changes thrust Timber to, in Canada into like a whole different ball game entirely. So this is like Timber of today. Um, you know, at Elliston, at Bird, at PCI, all of the big players are, are now involved in this. And, you know, where it's headed is like into large, ubiquitous, um, kind of a lot of times rectilinear structures that uh, we're opting for timber as just like a, a viable alternate to steel or concrete. Um, this is a job I'm showing here. It's now topped out, but this is our Centennial College project in Scarborough, um, which is in Toronto. Um, you know, it's an institutional building. You can see the people down here to get a sense of the scale of this. It's 100,000 square feet. Um, you know, I'll touch on just a couple of things here. You know, you see the concrete cores, as we talked about a little bit. That's 
uh, sometimes important to the authorities, sometimes important to uh, meeting financial objectives. But there's also some steel or sort of uh, some wood bracing that's getting erected, which is forming part of the lateral system. So in a way, this is like a hybrid lateral system. Um, you'll also notice that there's like a white surface on all the wood going down here. And that's like, uh, just shows that there's like some extra considerations you have to take into account as a contractor when building this way, because the thing we're putting up as a structure is also the finished appearance. So depending on when you're building, where you're building, the season, what it is, you got to care a lot about moisture and moisture contents. And Tim touched on, you know, how that becomes important to the shrinkage conversation. Um, you know, Tim mentioned it goes up kind of efficiently and, you know, this is kind of how it arrives. You see the truck, we kind of stack it like a kit of parts, the columns, the beams. Um, and uh, yeah, this is actually a situation where we're utilizing multiple tower cranes simultaneously, which we'll talk a bit about a, a bit later. So this is like, this is timber today and, and this is, you know, it's a pretty good size building, but it's, uh, it, these are gonna grow. Um, and so we're, what's happening from here on out, uh, Matt Elston, at least. Um, and so, you know, we have a bunch of stuff coming down the pipe. And the thing I want to communicate here is that it's not just one sector that's saying, hey, we want timber. It really started with the institutional sector. Um, the institutional sector, that's colleges and universities. They have different motivations than a lot of the private development sector. And they saw timber as like a, uh, utilizing timber is like a visible representation of their commitment towards sustainability. You know, they're trying to attract students, they're trying to attract uh, faculty, and they wanna show the outside world that they're committed to sustainability. And so they grappled with timber. Uh, first, they have different um, kind of financial mechanisms that they work within that allowed them to do that. And uh, we're, you know, Centennial College is one, we're also building a, a beautiful student residence for Humber College uh, right now in Toronto, 300 beds, sitting on top of actually a, a, a large, tim, uh, sorry, concrete podium. Even there's a bit steel gymnasium, so huge hybrid using materials where it made the most sense for that client. Um, you know, the next sector to really kind of come on board and, and uh, we're building quite a bit for is the private commercial office sector. And so we have about 300,000 square feet of office going up in Toronto, um, six story building an eight story building. These are the ones I was uh, I, I mentioned before. They, these ones don't have any concrete core. These ones are using something, uh, a steel braced frame system. And there's some interesting schedule benefits to doing things like that. Um, so that's coming, that, that's actually getting erected today in Toronto, if you, if you happen to be around uh, this area. Uh, you know, some office happening out west as well. And, um, you know, the, one of the last sectors to really come on board uh, you know, that we've seen at least, um, the, I'll caveat all this by saying, Ellison, we work on big scale projects. And so we don't have a great grasp of what's happening at like the four story and below world. Um, but in the high rise, the bigger companies pushing the envelope, residential has really not uh, had much of an uptake on it, you know, because they have a very different kind of financial performer they're trying to meet. Um, and so really the only ones getting up to the plate currently are uh, kind of purpose-built rentals. Um, and there's a lot of people who are kind of just waiting to see um, what happens. So we're, we're actually, in addition to being the contractor and a lot of them, we're, we're becoming mass timber consultants directly for external clients um, who kind of just want a, a steady hand with them. So, you know, I'll just like, there's some things that, you know, are commonly communicated in the industry and this middle chunk of the presentation, I'm just going to like, Go through a bunch of them that you've heard you know when, when we were tasked to figure out what mass timber is all about five years ago we didn't know anything i didn't know what mass timber was and we just spent five years getting to know the all the players all the bits and pieces and you know you hear some things over and over again it's controlled it's precise you know those things pan out those are actually true um you know what we're designing for is very different thinking than if we're designing for a concrete building we're designing for a manufactured process. And so that front ends a lot of the decision making, especially around mechanical. You see all these like tiny little dots. This is actually brought commons, I think, uh, not built by us. But, um, you know, it, it's common that all, all jobs have this like mindset shift, mindset shift where we have to kind of uh, front 
and load some of the design and coordination work so that we can um, manufacture them and you, you reap benefits later on in the erection stage uh, for successfully doing that. Um, anyways, Tim mentioned this, they become assembly sites. I just threw this one in at the last second, just to give you guys like a, cl a closer up visual of what Tim was mentioning, how the strategy to overcome fires in, in these large mass room buildings is twofold. Firstly, you can kind of oversize the member so that it chars. So, you know, the middle is still totally fine structurally. The char actually insulates the interior. And so you just kind of oversize the member a little bit so you can achieve your rating, whether it's one hour or two hour. That's strategy number one. Strategy number two, um, which is used sparingly, but um, can still be effective in certain applications is you encapsulate, which is just like the entire strategy for steel structures um, is also at our disposal for timber. You know, you can put drywall on some elements, not something we like to do, you know, because we like to see the timber, but there's a lot of cases where it actually makes quite a bit of sense to do it um, in, in certain areas. So, just, you know, uh, it is an option for timber that I wanted to point out. I also threw in some photos here. There's some talk about, you know, do you need concrete cores? And I just want to show you a couple examples. You know, you can use concrete cores, and we talked about how there's some efficiency benefits in certain jurisdictions to do so. We're also building quite a few with steel cores. Um, CMU core is still on the table, especially you know, you're building three, four stories. It's pretty efficient. Um, the thing that we're interested in quite a bit are like the braced frames whether it's timber or it's steel, um, there's some efficiencies to be had. And honestly, they just like kind of look cool to use like a braced frame uh, structure. And as a contractor, we care a lot about how we break up the scopes of work. And it's really efficient and desirable to put the whole structure erection into one trade scope. And so by putting a braced frames instead of a concrete core, you can kind of consolidate scopes, which is a nice have on site. You can use shear walls out of timber. And there's some interesting, um, probably far out research getting done on post-tensioned uh, glue lamb as well, but uh, really ambitious work coming out of uh, some US universities. Anyways, all this to say there's quite a few options. There was also a bunch of like, talk about acoustics and I basically just kind of built this presentation as I saw the chat unfold. Um, thanks Nick for the flexibility there. The uh, Acoustics is important and honestly a challenge that timber buildings have and it's not because anything scary it's challenging because people love to see the structure and you know steel buildings people don't care as much to see the structure so you can put drop ceilings in a bit easier. You can throw drywall drop ceilings in like like this, you know, a lot of timber buildings don't have the luxury of treating from below. And so then what you have to do is treat for acoustics from above. And that means you add in layers into the system. You know, acoustic strategy is all about adding mass and decoupling that mass from the structure. And this is why the common approach in North America is to opt for a concrete topping, adds a lot of mass. Um, and then if you need to, you can decouple that mass from the structure by adding in a more resilient layer. This is honestly optional, depends on your acoustic performance and your topping thicknesses. We call this like a wet system. This is like, it's wet because it involves an additional wet trade pouring concrete. Um, you know, the alternative to a wet system is a dry system, which is more common in Europe, um, hasn't taken too much uh, of the market in Canada just yet, at scale at least. Um, but there's, a, there's some manufacturers of um, um, Acoustatec being one of them where you can buy panelized systems. NOF is another one where you can get kind of insulation or kind of built in um, decoupled systems to lay down. It comes with a couple of challenges because you have to become, you know, if you're laying down insulation, you all of a sudden have to be watertight when you do that. So changes your whole sequence on site, changes how you install a kitchen, it has some cascading impacts, but dry systems are interesting and uh, just let, a bit less common today, but you can see you can really achieve Kind of whatever STC, IIC ratings you want. IIC becomes pretty important, um, especially in the residential world. Um, okay, just another random talk of topic. I'm just going to jump around here for another couple minutes. St schedule. You know, we're a contractor. We always drive budget and schedule. I wanted to kind of talk about our experience with schedule because a lot of people, 
you know, talk about how timber is great on the schedule front. And uh, a lot of it has to do with um, comparing back to concrete where, you know, when we cast our concrete, we have usually three to four stories of reshoring where we put up a million posts to uh, wait till the concrete comes to full strength. And it's kind of hard to do work on those other floors while all the post shores are in the way. And so, you know, obviously the nice thing about timber is the timber comes full strength. So you claw back some savings, some work. Your next activity can start uh, a bit sooner. That, and in addition to that, you know, the timber goes up at the pace that you can set it. So, you know, this is not saying that timber, you can lift timber pieces faster than you can lift steel. That's actually like not true but you're governed entirely by the crane. And so you have that in your control. If you wanna work longer hours, if you, if you wanna like work weekends, late shifts, whatever, double shifts, you're entirely governed by the pick rate and how you've resourced the crane. And so you can move faster on the timber if you wish to. Um, those things are not free, we should mention. Um, but the caveat I'll say is that if, you, if this was a concrete slab, we'd pour it, we'd reshore it, we'd strip the form, we move on to finishing. With timber, there's often additional activities that are not involved in a um, concrete uh, or steel structure. So let's just go through a, a higher rise building. This is a Montreal tower uh, built a couple of years ago called Arbor. So, you know, on the leading edge, you're installing the timber one floor down, you're, uh, you're usually finishing off the timber. You're doing the joints, which are called splines. You're usually doing the diaphragm steel and you're touching up any field cores that maybe weren't coordinated properly. Then you have to do the floor below it. You're prepping for your concrete topping, um, you know, which I mentioned for acoustics. Maybe you're putting down an acoustic mat, you're putting down um, um, pore stops. This is an activity that doesn't exist in a concrete building. So like, you know, Think about that, that part of the schedule now. You pour the concrete topping, of course, that doesn't exist in a concrete building. Um, and then you have all your follow-on trades, which you would normally have. And so, you know, the timber can move fast. That's true, that's fine. Um, it's not a home run in terms of uh, overall project schedule. Um, and that's really what matters to a client, right? Is when are you finishing the entire job? And unless you resource the follow on trades, which is, you know, 75% of the job higher than you would have otherwise. So some lumps up savings because of the fast resourcing on the crane. Um, and um, honestly, the taller the building gets, the more efficient the timber gets as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we, uh, we can talk through that in more detail. We, again, this all changes at lower rise buildings, you're building one, two story buildings, none of this stuff applies. Uh, we work in, uh, at our company, we work largely in like the six plus story world where it's all about like basically turning your building into an assembly site. So we care a lot about that. Um, and the dynamics are very different in smaller buildings. Just a couple of caveats there. I'll skip over that. Um, just wanna to touch quickly on the supply chain, you know, this is, a, Tim mentioned this, there's a lot of great companies out there, a lot of smart timber engineers and suppliers, and it's a maturing market. So this is like a glimpse, actually a little bit out of date at this point of the North American supply chain. And, you know, the thing that's important to understand is that they all do different things. Um, and, uh, you know, they all have different capabilities. We're buying a manufactured product. And so, you know, it matters what they have in their factories in terms of capabilities to press panels. This is just like a, 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 a glimpse of how wide they can go with their CLT presses as one product. They have also the same constraint on glue lamb. And so when we're designing pro these projects, we like to onboard these trades fairly early on so that we can design uh, for an optimum result uh, from a supplier. And, um, you know, that becomes important when you're talking about procurement. How are you going to procure the work? Is it going to be design build? Is it going to be an integrated approach? But, um, you know, that is the way to go. And we try to steer clear of more um, stipulated sum or lump sum environments where you don't have the opportunity to optimize. Um, and we can touch on that a bit more. I'm gonna skip through this whole thing because uh, I wanna talk about, um, you know, where's this headed for us? You know, we're, we're, we, we did a couple years of learning. 
we uh, got our feet wet. We're now deep into the execution on some of the bigger timber jobs in the country. Um, it's a lot of fun. What are we going to do next? Like, how are we going to advance this industry? And I wanted to show you two big research projects that we have on the go right now. Uh, one of them geared towards the commercial industry, one of them geared towards the residential industry. Um, so start with like the hybrid timber panel is what we're calling it, which is like a, a way to push the boundaries of what you can do with CLT. Um, you know, people like using timber in office buildings, but they don't like having deep beams. They don't like necessarily having column, um, additional column lines. It's not bad actually when it's timber, but we're, we're trying to find ways to uh, innovate and, and push beyond it. So what we've come up with and what we're testing out currently with the support of uh, NRCAN is a hybrid timber panel system where you get uninterrupted 40 foot clear spans, which you can't do with uh, just a normal piece of CLT. And um, you know it's obviously a lower carbon solution. This is to not replace timber building. This is to uh, go after buildings that are almost exclusively steel um, in the current market. Uh, we deliver the exposed finish, which is desirable, 40 foot clear spans. and um, Obviously, we can manufacture them off-site. We're opening up a factory, uh, which already exists. Um, and so I just want to show you a couple of photos. This was actually this week. We're casting samples for fire testing, for structural testing. Uh, we've partnered up with FP Innovations, who's one of like the leading researchers in this market. And um, yeah, it's pretty exciting. We're going to probably bring this to full-scale market next year. The second project, which is even more exciting to me, is uh, our answer to residential and we're, we're you know there's more and more talk about how do you how do you bring productivity into construction we're the less efficient than farmers and everyone in the world and so Elastan has taken like an aggressive approach to volumetric construction which is you build a say you build a condo or a hotel room or a student residence in a box in a factory and you stack these boxes on site 95 percent done We've uh, done this in steel already. We've learned a bunch of lessons. The steel approach is not the right answer on the carbon perspective. Uh, so we've designed, and we're also currently testing out um, a really exciting mass timber version of this, where um, we're able to go, you know, at first up to six stories. We're going to try to dip our feet and get uh, get some successes there. Um, and uh, you know some really interesting possibilities here. We'll be able to uh, you know offer uh, to again low, very lo a low carbon solution, utilize timber, fully exposed uh, finishes. Um, we're utilizing the wood as the fire rating, so you know we won't have to put drywall on this if we don't want to, and uh, which offers you some pretty incredible advantages from the manufacturing standpoint. Uh, we're opening up the supply chain to uh, anyone in Canada. Um, some interesting aesthetics coming out of it. So, you know, we're deep in R and D right now. The panels are landing in our plant next week, actually, to assemble, and um, bringing this one to market probably this summer. So, anyways, that gives you a glimpse of like where we're thinking, what our team is up to, um, and we're pretty pumped. It's not something that we consider as like a fad or that is a, a flash in the pan. Elephant's like doubling down and trying to really invest heavily in the in the future of this. So, yeah, I'm happy to uh, answer questions now or reach out anytime if you want to kind of discuss further. Fabulous! Thanks so much, Mark. What a great presentation. Uh, thanks for for going on the fly and fitting in some of our chat questions, and and thanks for giving us a little glimpse of what you're up to innovation wise. Very exciting. I definitely think the the prefab uh, model is is going to take off. You know, especially when you look at things like the Energy Sprong in the Netherlands and uh, other ideas like that. Um, you know, we're we're definitely going to see that come down the pipe. We do have a few questions. I just had a quick one myself. When you're building at your scale, is is mass timber generally cheaper and less expensive than concrete and steel, or does that sort of vary depending on the project? Yeah, it, I, I actually I, I took out the cost slides. I didn't I didn't know how much appetite there was for that, but it's a great question, and it's usually the first question. Yeah, I, I can touch has. on that. Oh, I can. Uh, I'll I'll tell you our experiences. It'd be interesting to compare to yours, Patrick. Too, um, you know, we build everything we're building is outside the building code, essentially. It's all above six. It's all uh, fully exposed. We've done uh, buildings in and markets across the country, Vancouver, Alberta, Toronto, Newfoundland. Um, 
And we've done it for the, the past five years. And so when we started four or five years ago, we were seeing 25% premiums to, from timber to um, uh, con steel concrete. Two years ago, we were seeing 15% uh, of premiums, 10 to 15% premiums. Today, we're actually executing them um, with our clients. And uh, in the institutional, in, you know, I'll set the institutional sector aside because they're doing things that are not cost competitive in a, lot, a large sense. In the private commercial office sector, um, today in Toronto, we're still pricing timber at a premium of four to eight percent, um, very, very consistently um, in Toronto. In Vancouver, it comes closer. We're seeing like single digits under five percent. Um, but it depends who your supplier is. You know, there's a lot of volatility also on like the uh, supply chain over the course of these two years that I'm talking about. Uh, in some cases, we've managed to hold pricing and, and kind of insulate ourselves a little bit. In a lot of cases, um, you know, there's been some volatility in timber, just like there's been in steel. Um, steel has been up 30% in two years, right? And so, you know, uh, the clients that we're building for are all uh, going above the building code, which adds extra costs. I want to be clear about that. They're not like acceptable solutions. Uh, and so they're doing extra sprinkler systems, extra foot elevator things, um, which contributes a little bit, but we're uh, across the board at a premium. Patrick, I want to hear what your take is. Yeah, so I will uh, talk a lot about that in my presentation. So, yeah. Yeah, great. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah. save the yeah. we'll save the price discussion, and we'll we'll roll that over to uh, to Patrick's presentation. There's a few questions that came into chat from Mark. First, quick one, okay. Mark is um, Judith was wondering where is the built passive house city center in BC. She's wondering on location on that. Oh yeah, it's a it's called Clayton Community Center, and it's yeah. uh, just outside of um, just outside of Vancouver in uh, oh, Richmond or Langley. I forget one of the two. I think it's like great. Great. Uh, Justin's wondering what is the best global building type application for mass timber? What's the best global building type? I mean, I, I think it's like honestly very flex it's, it's very flexible. And I think we uh, what we're seeing is like the uh, it's all about optimizing for for the product itself. And so the the material properties of timber happen to happen to make it a pretty well-suited product for spans that our market likes for, uh, our market likes these spans for commercial office buildings generally. Um, you know, it's some institutional spaces like a lot of um, larger open spans, which makes it a little bit challenging, but uh, yeah, I'd say it's gonna, I'd say once we um, get to full cost neutrality, uh, in all markets, it's really going to take off in the residential world too, because it's much shorter spans. You can really achieve a lot of efficiencies. Indeed, yeah, it must be a bit like the stock market, watching all the the different prices go up and down for for lumber in different regions and stuff. So, I'm sure uh, some folks are really crunching every penny there. So, Michael's wondering, does your group have trained carpenters that now erect mass timber, or do you find local erectors to do this work? Um, have you been running into supply and schedule issues with mass timber delivery? So, a two-part question there. Yep. Yeah. So, on the installation front, we've. we've uh, to date, we've uh, subcontracted the installation out to um, to uh, uh, unionized carpenters, and you know there's some union issues depending on where you're building as well. But uh, as an example, the, the Centennial College job was installed by a Quebec-based um, firm. So half the half the carpentry crew is from Quebec. Half of it was supplemented by the 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 local union here. Um, you know, we have a large uh, employee base of carpenters. We own a former company, which has like hundreds of carpenters in. And so, um, we self-perform all of the work in our plants. So all of that stuff about modular and, uh, prefabrication, that's all self-performed. But uh, in terms of on-site unionized install, we've, uh, we've currently subcontracted everything. That might change Great. in the future. Great. And then Alper was asking a similar question to the second one. Um, oh, yeah. The steel procurement takes almost a year now. What is the procurement delay with mass timber? What, what are your wait times looking like with some of that uh, supply chain issue? Yeah, it's a good question. It, honestly, like there's um, the, when you, 
this again is a, something that's very different if you're building a small building versus a very large building. The, the very large buildings take up quite a bit of a production slot in each of these suppliers plants because there's a, a physical machine that has to press open and close and they kind of schedule in each of those presses uh, quite a distance out. And so what we're finding is that we have to engage with the timber supply chain uh, basically at a minimum of 10 months out. Um, if we're going to build anything over 100,000 square feet. And that doesn't mean we're paying them up front or they're producing up front. It just means we're locking in a production slot, which is um, which happens generally, um, you know, eight to 12 weeks in advance of timber arriving on site and actually overlaps with the installation. And so we haven't, you know, if you have the appropriate planning in place on your project, we actually haven't come into the situation at all where we have trouble finding timber. Um, but it's it's generally because the large projects are planning years out, and so we're just like locking in suppliers, um, um, you know, at a, quite a distance away. But there is a long lead time. You know, adding in a, a procurement that's ten to twelve months out is is uh, something you have to like understand during design development. Usually, we hire contractors somewhere around like the thirty percent DD mark of, of drawings. Neat, neat. Yeah, definitely something you have to consider as you're uh, building out, right, is, is when all these different things are going to come in. Rosalind's wondering, what are the drivers for the higher cost premiums previously and the drivers for the decrease in those premiums that you were talking about? Yeah, I mean, I, Patrick will probably touch on this quite a bit. I'll just mention a couple uh, things of note to us. Um, you know, the, uh, the maturing supply chain helps out quite a bit with the the driving of the decrease of premiums, um, you know, there's a, there, I showed a quick map and that if I, if I put up the same map three or four years ago, there'd be like half as many dots on the map. You know, it's a, it's, it's a fairly competitive marketplace and the, uh, it's maturing. And so that certainly helps with the competitiveness. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll leave the cost for Patrick to elaborate on quite a bit. Absolutely, yeah, and maybe we'll uh, we'll have you circle back after Patrick's presentation. Yeah, yeah. If there's any other questions, really appreciate your presentation, Mark. Exciting to see uh, all the great stuff you're up to, and uh, yeah, really, really thank you for for coming on and sharing some of the innovation that you're involved in. Yeah, appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. All right. Well, Patrick's been nice and patient. I know he's been uh, playing a bit of daddy duty too in the background. So thanks so much. He's the director of Mass Timber over at Bird Construction with the National Strategic Development Team. Growing up within the sawmill and wood manufacturing sector, Patrick brings unparalleled expertise that is demonstrated through his $1 billion worth of construction value experience and commitment to numerous agencies that are advocating for the use and benefits of mass timber as a sustainable and economic solution. In his role, Patrick supports 18 districts across Canada with a focus on providing constructability input during the design and pre-construction phases. Uh, he is an active member of the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition and a trusted advisor to infrastructure British Columbia and the Canadian Wood Council. So we really appreciate you being here, Patrick. Come on in and uh, excited for your presentation. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Nick. Um, yeah, so it's uh, a bit of a disadvantage for me being on the East Coast and uh, drinking more alcohol. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try not to uh, stutter my words too much. But Ultimately, my, my approach to mass timber when I speak to groups like you is, I want to tell you something. I'm not telling you what I'm going to do. I want to tell you something that you may not understand or set your project up properly um, so that we can grow this industry together. So that's always my approach. And to, I guess, legitimize that effort, I have to say that, you know, Bird, like Elliston, are very focused in the mass timber space. And, you know, we can go on talking about many of these market dynamics and, you know, why we're exerting efforts into this market. But, you know, really, we have a half a billion dollars uh, in, in projects under construction or in pre-construction from Prince Edward Island to Victoria, BC. So one thing that's, uh, you know, interesting about BIRD, and this is going to be the last slide about BIRD, but 
It's, um, I've been in the, you know, wood construction, mass timber industry for over a decade. And these are really the five salient points that everyone needs to focus on. So we've developed a center of excellence of which I've been hired full time at Bird to really understand across the country how we're doing this collectively. So how are we procuring? How are we influencing projects? What is the you know, supply chain strategy? What is our insurance? Um, you know, QA, QC, and, and ultimately coming down to carbon. So what is unique about us is the fact that there's an individual like me that is, you know, like Mark, you know, one of the, the world's best that oversees everything. So we see the evolution from month to month. We see the change in, you know, prefab connections to, you know, CLT wall systems or, uh, you know, increased understanding of fire rating based on fiber reinforced polymer. Like there's so many different things that we know that the industry doesn't. So based on the start of my presentation, as I said, I want to teach you something. And these are the things that I've learned in my, you know, 10 to 15 years in the mass timber industry. And this is the most key one, is that you must design and understand the construction efficiencies around the supply chain and really, I guess, optimize around its constraints. There are certain manufacturers that can produce certain things because it's a natural product. So they can't necessarily produce, you know, large columns and beams, you know, in Eastern Canada with element five, because we have spruce pine and fir, um, you know, on the West coast, yes, they have Douglas fir, Southern, Southern yellow pine. They can do, you know, certain things. Certain manufacturers have the ability to do like wider CLT panels, you know, Nordique and, uh, Shibugumu Quebec can do like bigger CLT columns and beams. So you have to be very careful about what you're specifying in your projects based on what, you know, uh, I guess a certain net of geographic manufacturers can produce. So Mark showed a, a, a great slide. And, uh, you know, this is kind of what we look at. And the supply chain is really broken down into two groups. So as an architect or as, you know, a contractor or an owner, you have to understand that there are manufacturers and then there are groups that are engineers installers that will go out to the manufacturers or go out to, you know, European producers. So you have to kind of balance how you approach the market to ensure that you're treated seriously, uh, I guess, to put you at the front of the line, uh, you know, in this very busy market status. So my suggestion is that you really focus on honey pots of understanding around grid efficiencies. For your type of building, what are you trying to achieve, right? Is it a, you know, group C, group D? Is it a, you know, uh, institutional building that has a crazy atrium or so on, what are you trying to achieve and how much competition do you need for your client's recommendations? And you have to under, understand the supply chain in order to really, uh, you know, get cost competitiveness. And this is why it's so important because you can have a billet show up on site or you can have, you know, connections or everything engineered directly into it. So that's kind of like my first fundamental thing. Um, you know, I could talk forever and, you know, we, we all glaze over. It's, uh, you know, kind of kind of late, but I always like to start with my conclusions, my punch points to get you excited. So that's the first one. The second one is optimizing mass timber products structurally and exposing architecturally. I'm actually upset with the approach of the you know, Canadian Wood Council and, uh, you know, how how we've really approached, I guess, the evolution of wood construction in our national codes. Mark can probably attest to this, but how many do we have above or within the 12 story range that actually want to be encapsulated? There isn't many. Everyone that's going to build with mass timber 
wants to have exposed solutions. So that is really what gives you the edge. Try and understand within your occup occupancy or specialization how you can expose it. So we don't want this to happen. That's Brock Commons. You know, these are, uh, you know, multi-residential examples. And then, you know, just like, why not have it exposed? Why do we have to have it encapsulated? So this is the main point, is that mass timber reinforces the need for collaborative delivery. If we are having our governments, if we are having our, you know, major, I guess, developers approaching the market with a lump sum or design bid build strategy, mass timber will not succeed. And this is going to address a lot of the cost uh, questions. So as far as fundamentals of the whole schedule is that conventional construction takes so much time on site and on-site is expensive. And there's never really true understanding of what people are doing. It's just depends on the quality of the site super, the people that you have on. So why not have more focus on the planning, leveraging the digital enterprise that, that we're all moving towards that can communicate directly with the manufacturers to produce the components that they need. So this is why mass timber is actually perceived to be a premium because there's so much more that goes on in that building when i look at a mass timber structure i try and be keanu reeves like this is matrix shit we're talking here you have to really look at it like it is a system it is not a commodity and this is part of the challenge for general contractors or you know cost consultants is how do we apples to apples compare what solution you move forward to based on your roi um, when you have things like this stuff showing up on site very quickly you know penetrations and floor panels wall panels to accommodate uh major trades bringing major trades on early to really understand what they can do to perhaps minimize uh you know cubic flow of air or or cost of the system uh to to reduce the overall budget i will say this is that the structure of a building is about 15 percent of the overall cost so why do we go to that first it's always m e it's like a you know 40 percent of the overall building building envelope is about 30 percent why are we not questioning these six so that we can maintain the the health and vitality and uh you know renewable aspect of a uh, mass timber structure so i'm going to revisit this statement you know mass timber really does reinforce reinforce the need for collaborative delivery and this is a project that we were successful on in ontario I can't even imagine how much this client spent to develop a program, develop a cost, uh, you know, develop a structural understanding, architectural understanding of the building that they wanted to have. And when it came to our desk after we were successful, I looked and I saw, oh my gosh, okay, that's a seven point, you know, like 7,500 uh, millimeter span. Okay, that's weird. There's a lot of purlins that are, you know, intermediary within that uh, bay grid. Well, I know from my experience that we could potentially extend that and reduce a lot of the wood in the structure. So why not evaluate a six meter by 12 meter span? And we did. So this is within, you know, hours of us receiving the information. And it fit very well within the programming department. We tried to understand what the footing analysis was. Does this mean that we need more foundation support? We don't. And it reduced the mass timber volume by like 50%. And what that also means is that that reduces the picks on site that Mark had talked about. So we always you know, try and target like six to eight picks, you know, per per hour. That's that's very good. So if we can, you know, reduce the per lens, 
that will really mitigate risk on so many ends of you know prefabricated solutions moving from wherever uh, of the manufacturer that was successful for that job. So you know that really does reinforce the importance of uh, collaborative project delivery. And it saved about four and a half million bucks on that project. So this is the other thing, is that contractors are not the best at holistic estimating. Costs are the, we love to talk about this. Developers love to say, I'm gonna build a, you know this building, what's the cost here, what's the cost here? So this is kind of the start of, you know, really what you have to think about as a, as a developer. And this is older information, but, you know, let's say that uh, mass timber is about, you know, $48 a square foot. And the developer told me that he was willing to absorb about 10 to 15% of an increased cost of the structure. And what it came down to is that his self-performed cost was 30 to $35 a square foot. So the premium of mass timber was 20 to 35%. So he, he said, no, we're not going to do that. And I said, well, let's just look at this further. Let's do a schedule. And a concrete schedule is, you know, 125 days. A mass timber schedule is, you know, around 61. And this is the holistic understanding that our industry needs to know, is that the value proposition, if you have a net positive of your schedule savings to occupy the building sooner, based on, you know, the weighted income of you occupying that sooner, uh, the differential in foundation, because wood is lighter, it's about one eighth the weight. Uh, differential in structure, you know, that's a premium for mass timber plus insurance. And we know that's also a premium, but we can talk about that. Um, so if you are positive in that realm, you should execute mass timber. So hopefully that addresses, you know, a lot of the key things of fundamental understanding that you know you can build upon uh that's kind of my my job and my focus so i i hope that's well and nick where am i with timing right now oh yeah you're all good no worries yeah yeah keep keep okay. rolling that was a great discussion on pricing uh and, and nice that it kind of looped back in on some of the trivia questions right when i asked Perfect. how much faster is uh is a mass timber project right as the first question so, so if, nice to touch on that and yeah, yeah over to you it, to talk about uh, embodied carbon for sure and 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 just going back to the main things if you're talking with people that are saying mass timber is faster mass timber is cheaper they are not experienced people because they don't understand your project it's those blanket statements that are actually not correct you have to you know spend a bit of time exactly what i said going through that understanding and you know, from Mark and I's perspective, when we're dealing with clients that are saying, "What is cheaper, steel, concrete, or wood?" Oftentimes, I'll say, "I don't, I don't even want to talk to you because you don't understand the holistic time it takes, uh, or the value that mass timber brings." So, um, anyway, this is probably the most important conversation that we are ignoring, and that we really need to understand. And it was in the new year that I've just kind of been on this path and thankfully supported by Bird. But these are my objectives. And it's to truly understand what global carbon tax means. Um, you know, how is that going to impact design construction, our, our daily lives? What is the carbon economy that's emerging for us to participate in and you know make money on? Two. How is embodied energy part of the path to net zero? That is the most important point. We have you know, this 2050 commitment and all of the infrastructure behind that is gonna happen in the next you know, eight years at, at 2030. And there's no talk about embodied energy. It's all about operational or the, or the cleanliness of the grid. Number three, develop recommendations for government and non-government entities. Again, these guys work on five-year plans. I'm approached every month by big post-secondary institutions, Crown corporations, 
Patrick, what do I do? What is my approach to carbon smart our infrastructure? And let's unpack this. So part of my education and understanding is based on these affiliations. Probably the best one has been the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. Go on their website, look at what they're doing because they're trying to understand how carbon can be fair, how tax can be implemented fair between Russia, China, Canada, everyone. Like what is everyone doing to make sure that we don't have a mass exodus of economy or you know, these unfair uh, playing fields on, on, on how you know, we're gonna solve this uh, path to net zero. And the Carbon Leadership Forum community, you have to sign up. They got amazing uh, webinars and so on. I'm gonna show one in a second. So what is embodied carbon? It is actually 90% of what you specify. And we misrepresent this. And I'm gonna show you why. New construction, according to Architecture 2030, the focus is on embodied. And the reason why is because our grids are getting cleaner, our design around the envelope and operation of the building is much more efficient. So the day that we hand you the keys over like an 80 year life cycle, the major impact is what you have specified in your building. Globally, when they've tried to model renovations, new construction, again, embodied is almost half. When we look at our building accreditation systems of, you know, post-secondary provinces, you know, federal government, they're actually bullshit. They are in today's age. And the reason why is because they focus on operation. They don't focus on embodied. And this is a, you know, a major uh, global study I won't get into. But the best example is this, is that a green roof. So here in Halifax, our new center plan, which is supposed to be a form-based code that anyone can go in and, and build whatever they want. If they have 70% of their roof is a green roof, it's uh, you know pretty much a yes. So the question becomes, are you lead chasing or are you actually focused on the thing that matters, which is carbon? A green roof is something that requires a lot of weight, more reinforcement going down through the structure of the building to the transfer slab and so on, the petrochemicals within the lining to prevent moisture going into the building envelope. Stuff like this actually increases the cost of construction and is a bigger detriment to the environment over time. So why are we making you know building accreditation systems part of our you know priorities and and investment so let's just look at this example this is a big hospital that i have to be a little bit uh you know uh i guess confidential on but a massive hospital and the whole structure requires about eleven thousand tons of co2 equ equivalents at an early life cycle analysis and where is all the carbon it's in the floor, it's in the structure, it's in the foundation. And the only other alternative today that is commercialized and code approved is mass timber. Okay, we can, you can ask me a bunch of questions about, you know, low carbon concrete and everything, but that's it. Bird construction is about 50,000 tons of CO2 equivalents a year for our commercial and industrial operations. And that's one project. So you have to understand the impact of that. Embodied is everything moving forward. OPG, a big project that we won here in Ontario. The only way to get to low carbon construction is mass timber. Um, all right, Nick, I, if I'm going over time, just uh, cut me off, but where am I? Am I good? No worries. We we got we always build in a little extra time in case we run right. over on the presentations. So, so no worries. I want to show finish this. up and then we'll uh, we'll go kind of round table on some questions. Okay, this is uh this is critical. Sorry. 
done quite a bit of this kind of analysis in Rwanda with my previous Can job. Can you hear the audio? And I first wanted to look at a, pro a project of my own. This is my cottage up in Halliburton um, that I designed and uh, for my own family. And, and, and you know, it did all the right things, uh, what I thought was sustainable, designing it eight, nine years ago. It's, it's off-grid. It's uh, completely based on solar PV. It takes, you know, all the basic passive principles into the into account, but I had not really thought about embodied carbon. So doing this kind of uh, analysis, coming back to it after those years, you know, really was, was eye-opening. So this kind of, you know, sectional study of the building, you know, revealed that by by cubic meters, it's not a wood building. It's, it's anything but, you know, that this is made out of a whole bunch of different things, the standard Canadian construction here, uh, that this cottage is 92 tons of, of uh, you know, equivalent. This is roughly like my whole lifetime driving a car in Canada wrapped up in this one project um, that only 10% of the emissions of this building are associated to the wood framing that you just assume this, you know, wood clad, wood framed, wood for, uh, wood interior project, uh, only 10% of it. That 65% of it was, was uh, encased in the crawl space foundation of this cottage, a space we only ever go down to to occasionally get like a box of wine. Um, totally unoccupied and totally unnecessary. And furthermore, you know, that more than half of my cottage is from, from petrochemicals. And, and really, in hindsight, you know, thinking, you know, I, I, I carry a certain amount of, you know, schadenfreude with me. And I think at this point, you know, it's really, you know, I've stopped to really reconsider, I think, my education and the assumptions that I have as one, as a Canadian, and, and, and two, as a Canadian architect and, and someone in the built environment where I think it's it's time for us to really reflect. Okay, so I'll uh, move on, but a net zero building is not the correct building for the solution of climate change. And it all comes back to embodied. And this, this is what, you know, European entities are understanding. This is what I'm working with our federal government on trying to understand is, you know, when we develop our energy code and we specify certain materials, I saw a, a question in the chat about like ICF, you know, ICF, that building could last for 200 years at a, at a better efficiency, but it would never counteract, you know, the embodied energy that went into that structure. So this is what the Europeans are looking at. Um, at the UK, they're now capping embodied energy on an annual basis. And uh, the in France, they're saying that 50% of public buildings now have to be built with wood. So I, I know a, a lot about this in, in this space, and I'm happy to, uh, you know, kind of stimulate this discussion and uh, answer any questions. So thank you very much. Oh, wait, awesome. hold on. Yeah. Last slide, last slide. Always so, one last slide, right? Yeah, for sure. So this is truly the main point, is that if you're going to do a lump sum project, or if you're working with a government entity, or, you know, a group, and you're trying to get the low price, you're, you're going to fail. Uh, because when we're trying to work in mass timber, it's a prefabricated solution. There are different species, depending on where you're going. There are different manufacturing capabilities, like I said, in the supply chain understanding. But now we have these other factors. You have to understand carbon impact in procurement. You have to understand the indigenous impact. How are we going to integrate you know, those design principles and, and partnerships, supply chain challenges, and obviously price volatility, uh, just where we are today. So I you know, would love to talk more about that, but uh, that's uh, how you can implement mass timber and sustainability. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Nick. Yeah, thanks so much, Patrick. Great presentation. Uh, really enjoyed kind of getting the nitty gritty on the costing and then understanding a little bit more on the embodied carbon side of things as well, which, you know, I think you're right. It's, it's, uh, it's something that people aren't talking about, but I think it's slowly becoming more of a focus um, as we tighten up those other uh, areas and elements. So great presentation. I didn't have too, too much in chat for questions. I think everyone was just, uh, oh, here we go. We've got one from Michael just came in there so that's great uh what is your key takeaway from your moisture management plan would you be able to share with this group to help better the construction of mass timber across canada so patrick or michael's just wondering about your moisture management plan 
Yeah, for sure. So depending on the mass timber material you specify, if you're working with nailed laminated timber, obviously it's, uh, you know, only dry to 19% and it's mechanically fastened together for like a roof or floor system. You need to have more of a understanding about, you know, how that's going to expand and the vulnerabilities of that, your expansion gaps between panel to panel. If it's CLT, you know, it's cross-oriented. It's a little bit, uh, you know, more, more stable when it is wet. Um, but depending on the scale of the footprint versus the height of the building, you have to have, uh, you know, certain considerations. So what I would suggest is this, is that there are four main principles that affect uh, material degradation or dimensional change. And the first one is moisture content. So if you can prevent that piece of wood from exceeding 28% moisture content, which is the fiber saturation point in lumber, you will not have growth, okay? If you can uh, post-occupancy prevent wood from, you know, going above 80% moisture content in a 20 uh, degree centigrade environment, again, you will not have any dimensional change in the wood. So there are very fundamental principles that if you have your moisture management plan not hit those and you know the science and you can communicate to your insurance broker or whoever, um, you will have success. Great. Um, Judith and Lori are wondering, can you please repeat that point about France and regulations that you mentioned during your presentation? Yeah, so uh, France said that public buildings need to be 50% uh, wood. Great. And the reason why, um, I've spoke to all the major specifiers over there and architects and engineers to understand based on my carbon, um, you know, path here in Canada. And they said it's easier to make a commitment based on what we know than it is to wait for the science based on our current situation. So that's it smart uh spencer's wondering have there been any solutions investigated to replace concrete as a foundation material to manage embodied carbon totally so it spencer uh colleague of mine amazing he's uh he's he's jumping in um so yes there are major efforts that are hugely federally funded, you know, even funded by Bill Gates to try and understand how we can reduce the embodied energy of uh, concrete. And the challenge is, is that there's a window, you know, when you bring in these, these materials that are lower carbon to help cure and make it strong enough based on the carbon intensive concrete that we know, um, you, it, it requires this same thing as, as mass timber, early award, early conversation, um, you know, early uh, collaborative delivery. So yes, you can do that, but that's what it requires. Smart. Uh, pres uh, Raymond's wondering, preserved wood foundations were popular a few years ago. Any comments on how well they would work over time? Uh, that's just such a small piece of the equation. I. Yeah, I just prefer to, same as biofuels and, and wood foundations, I just would rather not talk about it. Sure, no worries. Uh, Rosalind's wondering, um, she understands there are more suppliers in the marketplace now, but can you please provide more color as to drivers of the mast timber cost premium uh, versus the uh, decreased cost premium? And, and when do you think it's going to hit neutrality versus the steel and concrete? So it's it's very regional. Um, we all know there are certain consistencies in, in major markets. Uh, you know, form work is very difficult. Pre-eng buildings are, are a challenge. Uh, steel eye joists are a challenge. It all depends on what the client is, you know, willing to pay to occupy the building sooner. And it it is also important on what team you retain to provide that solution. Because if you just grab anyone to, you know, help you do the things that everyone's saying about mass timbers faster, it's not gonna work. 
often what we do is that we will do a very structural quick understanding and i know how to um you know talk to the manufacturers to say this is the volume this is the time and this would be the impact on your operation if we were to slide in in line so it's uh you know kind of kind of tough to answer you just you just have to talk to the right people Great. Uh, Laurie's Mark, pointer, Mark how... popped on, so he's probably got something to say. Yeah, Mark, did you want to jump in on that? Uh, I mean, I was just going to touch on a couple a couple specific things that come to mind in terms of drivers. And uh, Patrick mentioned it, like, go back like three or four years, people were just straight up pricing it as a premium in the sub-trade world. Uh, outside of the structure, the m and &E, the drywallers, because they didn't know what the hell was going on. And so like Patrick mentioned, m and &E is a giant chunk of the equation. And so if they applied, a, we don't know how this is going to affect us premium, uh, which does happen. Even if it's like an order of like, we'll throw 5% in, 5% on 30% is a big hit to the project. That existed, still does to some extent, when there's when there's not a lot of big timber buildings and regionally you know the uh, the major mechanical electrical drywall trades don't have experience with it um, um you know they these markets are busy construction markets they're not going to just kind of like um they're, they're pricing these things at a premium because they know they'll have to continue through a learning curve to execute you know they might realize on that curve Hey, this is actually way easier, but they still up front uh, very difficult to crack the uh, the premium. So much so less difficult Mark, today. Mark, I'll uh, yeah. you know add to that. That again depends on the model for construction. Like if you're in a progressive design build or IPD, you may be able to award these people early on and design the program and you know the intended use of that building to a specific budget um, with those key trades on and that's it and that's you know the main fundamental in the way that our government procures i find is that it's just now we're in a new world we've got new volatility we've got you know so you can't get a faucet you can't get a glass door you can't get these things so we need to find ways that you know, pro lock in the price as close to construction as possible. And, and, and that really is the key. And that supports exactly what we're talking about, about mass timber. It's that it's a prefabricated collaborative solution in order to realize everything that, you know, everyone talks about. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to throw that. Rosalind, did you want to jump in with any follow-up or comments on that? Um. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, taking this question. I'm um, a CPA by trade and I started in gold mines and with a lot of our pulp and paper companies. So this is super interesting to see the other side on fabrication. I get really excited um, when I hear solutions and alternatives to fabrication. So I'm at U of T right now and I'm studying sustainability, but I always think about the global context and where this might take us. And so Mark, if you might touch a little bit on when I hear that some of the premium is from potentially a forced or in, uninformed, let's call it, experience from the trades. I think about um, markets like China where, where we see large projected growth in populations and large projected growth in construction. And I think about, well, are they going to then absorb or take on a new product like this um, if their markets don't have the experience and are they going to price it out considering, um, yeah, how, how competitive some of these spaces are, so. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think there's actually quite a bit of Canadian wood going over to China, like they're already doing that um, mm -hmm. and they're grappling with it kind of a lot of it in the, the boutique world, like there's just some incredible structures going up in China that dwarf anything uh, we're doing on like the boutique area. There's some crazy domes. They're just like pushing, pushing the envelope. Um, you know, I think the, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it, it's important to recognize again, like Patrick mentioned, so, so regional, these like characteristics of the pricing um, and, and 
it really does tie into the procurement models that you know were, were talked about. So, um, you know, we actually don't do any work outside of Canada. So it's hard for me to like understand how the player, the construction dynamics are are operating. You know, um, in South America or in China. Um, although I would, you know, I, I think there is like some interesting potential for Canada with its like forestry sector positioned here to participate in those environments. And I think all of this kind of, we're, in, we're at this like early point in the industry where there's a lot of collaboration required very, very early on, um, which was the same thing that happened at the beginning of the steel structure um, boom. And even like newer things, holocore panels, now, you know, you can buy holocore panels from anywhere and you kind of kind of know how they work. So there's an opportunity for it to become a, a bit more commoditized. There's still interesting like nuances to that. But I think what we might start seeing is the industry um, breaking apart a little bit where there's going to be uh, manufacturers and then there's the people that buy the manufacturing and that is already happening in Europe. Um, but Canada is kind of very well positioned to uh, uh, take part in like the global rise that will be kind of required as the response to climate change. Um, I don't know much about China's construction market, though, to be honest. No, and it's great to see that, uh, you know, Canada is positioned that way, too. Mm. Thank you. Well, yeah. Thanks, um, Rosalind. Great question. Yeah. Uh, I can say something is that uh, Canada is revered as being like this poster child of sustainability and environmental commitment but no one knows what their what the path is you know we we show these commitments to reduce embodied energy we we you know have showed uh, indication to the global market of emissions tradings but we have no idea how infrastructure plays in that path to net zero and like i said in my presentation that is what we need to understand and, you know, we can do all these life cycle analysis, we can get all our products, you know, EPD, third party verified, but where is this going? What's the understanding? So, you know, that's a, that's a critical thing that we have to have. And yeah, no, great, great discussion. And uh, thanks, everybody, for the questions. I've got one more in chat that I want to get to for Lori. Lori's wondering how useful is low carbon concrete? She says high SCM contract concrete for lowering embodied carbon. Um, how widely is SCM used? Anybody want to jump in on that? Can can jump in. You can weigh in on a bit. I'm sure Patrick has some experience with it too. Very oh, widely uh, used in our in I mean in our market is extremely widely used. Um, as a as a actually you know there's a lot of like functional reasons why we would use a high SCM mix as well. Uh, for workability on site, for um, you know, different type of climactic conditions. Um, you know, the most notable example that happened last year for us was we're building uh, kind of an underground subway system in Toronto, and uh, we proposed to respec the entire mix for the whole project, uh, which resulted in like in the order of like 20, 30 percent less cement um, because of the SCMs that were used in the mix. So. You know, it's actually a it's a very common method to uh, it's practice to uh, increase the workability and the thixotropy of the mixes. It's um, less commonly associated with like being a sustainable thing to do. But I think there's a, a bunch of companies picking up on the fact that hey, you can actually just design your mix better and uh, and reduce the carbon impact. And you know, there's um there's some interesting companies that are popping up around that are using that as one of the kind of levers that they pull to offer low carbon concrete. So it's a, it's a growing, it's a growing um, part of the cast in place world for sure. It can't get you it all is. the way. And, and she, was, she was just wondering mass timber would be better for the climate though, right? We're, we're, it's got a better rating, I assume. Then. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what I was going to say. Like it can't, SCMs are not going to get you zero to zero. <laughs> It's oh, not going to exactly. take you there. And I think Patrick mentioned there's like a lot of kind of federal and international money getting pumped into, okay, how do you actually, what else can you do to car, to concrete 
uh, from the cementitious perspective or even like changing the aggregates so that it's embodied carbon, embodying carbon in the, the, the physical aggregate. Um, a lot of interesting stuff there that is trying to uh, come up with an answer. And honestly, you, we need that. We need answers to steal as well. Um, it's kind of a mixed bag, but Patrick, I'm sure you have uh, something yeah, to add I'm there. Chomping out the bit here. Um, so 36% of embodied carbon savings in a structure are due to uh, efficiency and structural design. So how much can you, you know, minimize the uh, rebar or, or floor thickness of this area, you know, and how much can we, you know, reduce the transfer slab here? Like it's all in collaborative design. And then the other note I have is 22% uh, of carbon reduction is in exactly that. So, you know, low carbon concrete, which has pluses and minuses based on its use and time of year. Uh, recycled steel slag is, you know, kind of the main offset besides Portland limestone uh, that's coming in and they all have, you know, challenges around strength and resilience based on the time of year that it's poured and, and the use that it's having. So I will go back to my statement in my presentation that I, I, I truly feel that mass timber is the only, uh, you know, commercialized low carbon solution for infrastructure right now. Yeah, no, definitely. And that's why we're featuring it here on Green Drinks, too. So I want to thank you all so much for your presentations. Um, I had one kind of last question to, to just chat about, and so I can understand a little bit better. Um, and Tim, feel free to jump in. Um, I'm wondering about the building codes. I know we talked a little bit about it. Are, are folks feeling like the building codes are holding back mass timber? Um, is it that, uh, you know, it doesn't go far enough? Um, is it my understanding that the, the, the wood needs to be covered over a certain um, flooring? Um, yeah, so, so make me understand a little bit more about where we're at with the building codes and where we need to go. And maybe Tim wants to jump in first on that one. Yeah, sure. I mean, I can uh, say that we're getting there um, in terms of acceptance. I think it's interesting to know, like a lot of the projects that um, that Mark went through and Patrick, um, I think I think Mark said everything that I'm working on is outside of the building code, uh, which makes a lot of sense. In order for um, mass timber to be used in the way that uh, Patrick alluded to and that makes the most sense for the product, yes, building codes are a, uh, a hindrance to it. I mean, we can we can build them to you know good sizes now with 12 with 12 stories and previously six but encapsulating the um product is number one it's not necessary to achieve the appropriate fire resistance ratings of the building code it's been proven through all of these projects that that meet that equivalency i i think it's important to understand when you go through an alternative solution or equivalency process you're not like allowed to build a building that is outside of the building code that's done like oh yeah okay give it a give it a go and we'll hope that it doesn't collapse it is scientifically and engineering wise proven to meet all the the requirements of of its occupancy so you can do it <laughs> like that that's what blows my mind it's not something that oh we we can't do it we can do it it's there it's in so many um examples from coast to coast around the world of much larger buildings than than the building code um, that than the building code allows. So, you know, Pat, like, and it's great to see these these speakers passionate about this hurdle. It's like, why? Like, give me a reason why that makes sense because none of them make sense to me. So, I mean, we're getting there. It takes time. Obviously, like in terms of construction, it's it's brand new. Like, thirty years in the world of construction is like. Uh, you know, five seconds in the world of the internet, right? Like it's, it's, it's not all that long, but, but we're getting there and I'll, I'll let the, uh, the other guy jump in, but you know, that's how we, we feel about it for sure. Patrick, do we want to go over to you and then we'll, uh, we'll hear from Mark? Yeah, no, Mark, go ahead. 
I'm going to take too long. Yeah, Mark, uh, you mentioned a lot of your projects are outside the code. So how do you guys get away with that? Oh, you're on mute there still, Mark. That's, weird. that's the first time that's the first time that's happened to me all pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have it to us all. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's just exactly like Tim said, it's I said outside the building code, but it's a, it's an alternative solution, which means you got to do a lot of work to just kind of prove out that you meet the intents of the code. You're just not meeting the uh, prescribed uh, limits of it. So, you know, honestly, in, in a lot of our projects, that is a premium cost adder. There's soft costs. There's a bunch of hard costs that get added in on that. Um, to go back to your question, like, that is some that is like uh, it is a headwind that we're always up against in our projects, which would be much nicer if it wasn't there. Like it's not uh, considering all these. There's a there's a lot of developers that are very risk averse. Um, uh, you know, clients that have uh, not much appetite for doing something. You know, you're not going to get fired for doing a concrete building, right? That's been proven. It's been uh, it's very acceptable in the building code. It introduces a layer of risk onto the decision making that um, is largely unnecessary, um, given the, the the deep research that's been done, um, not only in Canada but all over the world. And so, um, you know, I would say it's holding it's holding back uh, certain clients for sure, and um, and it's and it's not helping out on the cost equation either. I would say, like you know. These things evolve slowly over time, and the building code is supposed to like ratchet up consistently. But you know, just if there's something that you kind of learn during COVID is that all these things that we perceived as like, you know, this 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 thing has never changed in 30 years or whatever. All of that stuff changed overnight, like March 2020. Nothing mattered, right? So like that, if nothing else, should tell us that like. All these kind of like fake walls that we put around ourselves are like that they're fake right like the, if it's something that's actually important we're on timelines that don't agree with the building code timelines uh we should come to terms with that and have a little COVID moment and be like everything changes overnight look we have all the experts in the room we know we're confident in this so um you know it's a touchy subject for sure and uh you know something that i think um, is uh it requires like some intervention to change um patrick yeah no great great thoughts there thanks marco <laughs> patrick yeah over to you patrick for some thoughts on uh, on the building codes i know you'll have a couple actually i have, i have nothing to say sorry i'm just gonna go to bed now no no totally <laughs> kidding um but like really what it comes down to is just logic and like mark that was great insight you know, just on how things, you know, really need to change and authorities have to look at things differently. But the major challenge we have in mass timber is just the combustible versus non-combustible. And that is not true now with the evolution of mass timber, because if you were to have a, you know, like six foot deep CLT panel that could burn for, you know, days, it can still not be qualified in, you know, a uh, B occupancy building solution versus uh, like H steel stud. So it's 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 kind of a silly discrimination that that creates this challenge. And and this is kind of what I, you know, really try and be a squeaky wheel, uh, you know, in this industry and with Canadian codes. It's like, guys, why are we going for twelve stories? Like why, why 12 stories encapsulated? We, we have the confidence now. We know that these things work. We've done the demonstrations. We don't necessarily need to go higher. We need to focus on the classifications of structures that are built every day that, you know, people benefit from the biophilic environment that are within them. You know, we need to find more cost-effective exposed solutions within the, the classifications of buildings that are built every day. And, and that's, uh, you know, a major, uh, you know, that's where we have to focus as a country. That's a excellent um, point, Patrick, like just to, to kind of build on it. Like that's where I wonder too, I'm not, I'm not a code person, 
um, that, okay, we got to, you know, we got to six, let's get to 12, let's get to 18, let's do this and that. But, you know, group A occupancies or group B occupancies are stuck at like two stories in some cases or, or very limited where these are the types of buildings that, that are built every day. I heard a, like, what, a stat that blew my mind from a, a excellent mass timber engineer out of New York City. And she informed me that like 98% of buildings in all of New York, all the five boroughs are less than eight stories. 98% in New York, if you just think skyscrapers, like there's not that many. Yeah, no, great, great points. Uh, I want to kind of wrap up here. It's been a fabulous couple of hours talking mass timber. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mark and Tim and Patrick for your time. Really appreciate you coming on and, and speaking with us. I'll go around for some final comments and I'll sort of uh, pose this one last question. If you could see anything happen in the world of mass timber over the next year or two, what would be your, your big dream? Would it be lower costs? Would it be better building codes? Let's just pick one thing and uh, we'll start with Tim. We'll go to Mark. And yes, Patrick, we'll definitely get over to you. Tim, over to you for some final thoughts and what you'd love to see in the world of mass timber. Uh, what I would like to see is a better understanding of the product being offered. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Mark, some some dreams about what can happen in mass timber or what should happen. Yeah, I mean, the thing that occupies most of my brain space these days is how we can gain efficiency in general in construction. And I think timber is like an interesting piece of that. Um, and uh, obviously we're, we're trying to push into the manufacturing world in a bunch of different ways, but really excited to see what opportunities we can kind of crank out of uh, offsite manufacturing in general. Absolutely, yeah, the prefab, absolutely. Patrick, come on in with some thoughts, some final thoughts. Well, there's, there's a few and it depends on how you approach the the political system, but the main one is our government has to build with wood and they are the largest developer. We are a country that has this massive, you know, sustainably managed resource. Like why WTF are we not specifying this in the carbon landscape today on, you know, the majority of our FPs that are going out renovation or, or new construction? So that is kind of, you know, my new angle, uh, talking to CWC and, and, and a lot of the, you know, government and uh, industry funded uh, groups is we need internal lobby. We need to have people that are going to talk to government so that they build with wood. Absolutely. Great points, everybody. I'm, I'm excited to uh, see the future of Mass Timber. Great to check in on everybody again. Sounds like we're going to have to do this every couple of years and, and catch up with you guys and sort of hear what's what's going on. So really appreciate you coming in. And, and Patrick, as the, as the new man in, appreciate your time. We know you're on the East Coast there, so a little bit later. Um, yeah, want, want to thank everybody so much. Uh, thanks to everybody in the audience for a great session. Everybody had some great questions and stayed engaged. So appreciate that. A reminder, to join us for our next edition on uh, May 12th. We'll rack with the climate edition. So we'll be talking with uh, some folks from Environmental Defense and Cafes Ottawa. A big cheers to everybody for coming out. Enjoy your long weekends, everybody. Hopefully uh, everybody gets to take a little bit of a break. And then uh, come next week, we, we start building the future, right? Once again, it's Nick from SmartNet Alliance. Want, want to thank Tim, Mark, and Patrick so much. Really appreciate your time. And uh, we'll hope to see everybody again for another virtual green drinks. Good night.